स्थापकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय राम कृष्णाय ते नम वसुदेव सुतम देवम कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगत गुरु सो इन द लास्ट क्लास ऑफ भगवत गीता we were studying that portion of the third chapter of bhagavad gita the third chapter namely the karma yoga where we find bhagavan is explaining that even for a realized soul there need not be cessation of action that even after realization though he has no selfish need to pursue his action but for the welfare of the entire human kind the technical term which has been used in the bhagavad gita is loka sangraha so for loka sangraha for the well being of the entire human kind to is chalk out a path which others may follow he still continues with his actions there need not be the cessation of action we found that he gave the example of king janaka and after giving the example of king janaka he is citing his own example so in the 23rd shloka which we read in the last class before we proceed just we try to find out that what was the idea which bhagwan was speaking of तत् यदि हे हं न वर्ते यं जातु कर्मनि अतंद्रितः मम वर्तमानु वर्तन्ते मनुष्या पार्थ सर्वशः सो व्हाट ही सेइंग यदि हि अहं न वर्ते यं जातु कर्मनि अतंद्रितः दिस वर्ड अतंद्रितः इज अ वेरी सिग्निफिकेंट वर्ड tandra means to slip tandra means to go to a state of swoon it speaks of relaxation atandrita is a negation of that that what he is saying yadi hi aham if i na varteyam jatu karmani i do not continue to work atandrita without any relaxation and then what will happen if i now and then tend to relax then know it for certain o parth arjuna that all the inter human kind the men and the women they will follow my example in every way mama vartma anuvartante whatever i do that they will follow they also will tend to in action so that's the thing which we found that bhagwan as is citing himself as an example so we will find that sometimes there is no need for work but for setting out an example for others for motivating others action is prescribed just like a father at home he does not need to play with toys but children need to so we will find that the father also joins with the children to play with toys just to encourage them so that playing with the toys is something beneficial for the children it helps in their in, in their this growth of their mind growth of their intellect so for the children playing with the toy is something which is having some benefit having some implication but for the father it is not required but to 
encourage the children he also joins along with the children to play with the toys as if he is also enjoying it the child feels father also enjoys like me playing with toys but that's not the fact he is having nothing to do with the toys it is just to encourage the child to play with the toys to engage himself in that way so that his mind develops his intellect develops the father plays with the toys so that kind of communication with the children and the parents is necessary for the growth of the children so here also we find that sri krishna is a divine incarnation so he was as if then some scriptures they say dehastopi na dehast that though he is within the body he is not of the body he is as if not in the body dehastopi na dehast that though he is in the body but still actually he is in real sense he is not in the body that's what the scriptures say about any divine incarnation their birth their birth their life is for lokavattu leela kaivalyam so everything they do simply like a way of sport just like acting in acting they are like actors they in no way identified with the they in no way identify themselves with the role they are playing Sri Ramakrishna used to say that for a ripened coconut the shell gets totally detached from the kernel if the coconut is unripe it is almost impossible to separate the shell from the kernel but if it is ripe if you just take the coconut in your hand and shake it you will find that the kernel has got separated from the shell so what's the idea the real self is in no way attached to the flow called psychophysical existence the psychophysical existence is a flow it was it started at certain point of time it is going to cease at certain point of time and even as long as it is existing it is a flow it is changing constantly changing it is going through shadow vikar the six changes so the real self is in no way identified with that so the man of realization is always aware of that fact all our actions are because of the identification with the body and mind the moment we get identified with that now to preserve that we have to act there are certain things which are preferable for, which are favorable for life we have to acquire them something which is not favorable we have to desist from them so this attraction raga this hatred or this aversion for the things which is not favorable for my existence is dvesha fear of death abhinivesha these all impels us to act for him all such impulses has fallen off so there is no question of being motivated to for action but he goes on doing all those action as an example for the entire humanity to follow otherwise they will go wayward we will find that just to give an example when swami vivekananda made the rule about waking up early at 4 am at belur math when the monastery was formed everyone has to wake up at 4 am now it was of course applicable for the novice but for the one who is a realized soul the other direct disciples for them they have traversed the spiritual path they are all established for them these rules doesn't apply because throughout the day whenever they are awake when whatever they are doing they are always aligned they are always in tune with the divine nature so for them there is no need for some discipline their life the spirituality is something spontaneous for them but swami vivekananda made it a rule that even those direct disciples even he himself has to get up at 4 am for meditation and he made it a rule if anyone missed he would not be allowed to have his meals at the monastery he has to go out and beg his food in india you know the traditional monk every day goes out 
and it is called madhukari means uh, madhukari is very interesting idea that you have to beg food at least three houses you have to go minimum and maximum five you shouldn't go to how more houses more than five and it shouldn't be less than three the idea was madhukari just like the bee sucks honey from the flower in such a way it doesn't affect the flower the flower uh, it doesn't die it doesn't get dried off the flower continue to exist it takes just a little bit of honey but this by collecting little bit of honey from many flowers it also gets its own nourishment its own nutrition it creates it makes the honey by collecting little this nectar from all the flowers so what's the idea that you beg your food not by affecting anyone that it shouldn't in any way be at the cost of others earning because people have to endeavor a lot for their earning so you shouldn't go and just depend on them but take a little which doesn't affect him in any way so that's why not less than 3 so if you go and collect from one house you will be actually uh creating a pressure financial pressure on that person so just take little so not less than 3 from 3 houses let your meal be divided into 3 houses and not more than 5 the idea is that if you don't get your meal sufficient meal even after 3 begging at 3 houses you may go to the fourth you may go to the fifth and if you don't get still if you don't get sufficient you have to stop there thinking that that to for today this is sufficient because otherwise you will be just wasting your time begging your food you won't be giving is spending your time for your spiritual practices so you have become a monk for your spiritual practices for your contemplation and now you will be just begging throughout the day so take it for uh, just for certain take it for certain that today god has provided me this much only so whatever you get from five houses be sufficient be satisfied with that don't go for more than five houses so that was the rule so swami vivekananda asked the swamis to follow that traditional way of begging the days if they miss that waking up at 4 am so it entails a type of penance tapas and why swami ji made this rule but for all he himself also followed that rule even he himself you had to go for begging if he by chance for any reason couldn't get wake up at 4 am it happened the other direct disciples also went for begging he was so strict about it the simple reason if he as he used to say that if we ourselves do not abide by these rules how can you expect this novices the young boys will do so so that's the idea yadi hi aham navartyam so walk your talk that's the idea if you really want the people to follow the path prescribed by you you have to walk your talk that's the meaning of the word acharya the one who is through his achara not just through instruction through his way of life achara means how you are performing through his performances he keeps an example in front of others so the illumined souls should be like acharya so through their achara through their performances through their way of life they should set an example for others they should walk their talk so that's the idea which we studied in the 23rd sloka so after that what is saying the 24th so the same idea utsi deyu ime loka nakuriya karma chetaham sankarasya ca kartasyam upahanyam ima prajaha <coughs> that if i do not do that work nakuriya karma chet aham then what will happen <coughs> this world will perish utsi deyu <coughs> ime loka utsi deyu means this world will perish if i do not do the work this world will perish 
How will it perish? <coughs> Two factors he is saying. Sankarasya chakartasyam upahanyam ima prajaha. This Sankarasya, I will be the cause of social disruption. That's one thing. Social disruption is one thing. And the other thing is, I will be ruining the people. Means it speaks of as an individual, he, this, if, if they, as, a pers- as an individual, if they follow my example of inaction, they will be harming themselves. And not only that, collectively, as a society, there will be a social disruption. So these two factors, what he is speaking, upahanyam ima praja. <clears throat> the following the inaction, each and every individual will become lazy, there won't be any interest for work, they will avoid work. So, Swami Vivekananda used to say <clears throat> that <clears throat> tamas all generally comes in the guise of sattva. In a sattvic who is contemplative, he is not acting, he is most probably enjoying a deep bliss within. But seeing him in action, no one understand the subjective feeling of that person. That he is at bliss, he is not working. But the others will be just seeing his inaction. They can in no way relate to the subjective feeling of that person. And they will just follow the inaction. And that will enter into laziness. When Swami Vivekananda as a Parivrajak, as a wandering monk, was going around the Himalayas, going across the Himalayas, one day he saw a Swami, a monk, a traditional monk, appeared to be meditating. It's very cold there, so he was fully covered with his blanket, sitting and meditating. When Swami Vivekananda went near, he could hear the noise of snoring. Actually, he was sleeping. So Swami Vivekananda told, immediately told his brother monk, just see, that's what where our tradition, by misunderstanding the perennial wisdom of our culture, that's what it has at last ended to. There are so many monks in the name of spirit the pursuit of spirituality is leading a lazy life. Neither it is helping them spiritually, nor they are in any way benefit to the society. So it is something which is harmful for them as well as harmful for the society. So this laziness, no interest in work, avoiding work, so this becomes the cause of the personal degradation. And Sankara, the social disruption. So naturally, if I do not work, I cannot be a part of a teamwork. If you are lazy, you cannot interact with others. From laziness comes selfishness. A very uh, extremely poisonous selfishness. That for my own, that, that uh, what do you say, that comfort, I get so much addicted to my comfort zone that I, in no way I can be a part of a team. Just uh, having my role to play in any society, I have to be a part of a group, a community. You cannot. Because whenever you are in a community, you have to think of others' interest. That's the primary. And for that, for the time being, my own interest is secondary. I give others more importance. But this laziness leads to that utter selfishness. And then, as our Ranganathan used to say, that the moment with that type of selfishness, laziness, when we move out, we behave like billiard balls, he used to say. That billiard balls collide only to be apart. It is just creates friction turmoil in the society. No one in any way is ready to sacrifice a bit for the sake of social welfare. So Sri Krishna, he himself throughout his life was not only endeavoring hard 
but we will find he was meeting the royals, he was meeting the common people, interacting with them to generate a sense of collective welfare. So that's the thing, these actions again were not directed for his selfish ends. He was always endeavoring hard, he was meeting others from the royal to the common people, interacting with them, generating a sense of collective welfare, but nothing, not a single of his action had to do anything with his own selfish gains. It was just for the welfare of others. So that's the idea Sri Krishna is pointing out. That even if you realize so, work for the welfare of others. That as Swami Vivekananda made the motto of Ramakrishna mission, this Atmana Mokshartham Jagathitayacha, for your own spiritual well-being, for your own spiritual liberation, and for the welfare of the entire world. So this too should go hand in hand. So in the next two verse, Sri Krishna will, uh, Sri Krishna says that there are two types of people: enlightened and the unenlightened. The minority, the vidwan, is enlightened, spiritually enlightened. They're the few, and most of us, as in the spiritual sense, are a vidwan, unenlightened. And what is the responsibility of the enlightened towards the unenlightened? To bring, to just conclude this topic, he brings forth this idea in the next two slokas, slokas in the next two mantras. What he says in the 25th month sloka, Sakta karmani avidvangsa yatha kurvanti bharata kuryat vidwan tatha asakta Chikirshu Loka Sangraham. So this word Loka Sangraham comes in this 25th sloka. That as an unlight, unenlightened avidvangso, he is attached to his work. As an unenlightened, he is attached to his work, he acts. When, an unlight, when a person, an ignorant person is working, he has tremendous attachment. The enlightened also should act in the same fashion. Outwardly, it looks as if he is also attached like that unenlightened person. But it is only his actions. Know it for certain. O Bha descendant of Bharata, O Arjuna. So without attachment, in the same way, you have to work. Pure, this, for, a, for a selfish person, the motivation is own selfish goal and for an enlightened person, his motivation is the well-being of the world. That is Loka Sangra. It is not for his selfish end. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, very interestingly, that you may say that Loka Sangra is also, what you say, you cannot say it is, uh, what you say, that it is not detached action. That yes, it is not, I am not attached to my own well-being, but I am attached to the well-being of others. So how can you say it is uh, nishkam karma, that no desire is there? Desire is there. But Sri Ramakrishna used to say very nicely, that michri mishtir madhyana. Means, generally, if you take sweet, you are going to get acidity. But in the olden days, in the Ayurvedic treatment, <coughs> this sugar candy, if you, uh, that's crystals, uh, sugar, crystal sugar, that's sugar candy, if you dilute it in water and drink, it acts as an antacid. In Ayurveda they say, it cools your stomach, it digestive system. So, michri, the sugar candy is not to be considered as sweet. Michri, michri, madhya noy. Hinche shak, shaker madhya noy. Generally, if you take greens, if you are having some uh, stomach issues, your bowel uh, uh, syndrome, this irritable bowel syndrome is there. And then the doctor will say, yes, reduce the amount of greens. Greens is good, but for such in such case, you are supposed to restrict your intake of greens. But there are certain greens which actually help in digestion. So this is called Hinche Shak. Again in Ayurveda, the certain green like called hinche. 
So Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Hinche Shakin Muddhinoy. It is not to be considered as grains. Michri Mishti Muddhinoy. The candy sugar. The candy is not to be considered as sugar. Similarly, devotion to God is not to be considered as an attachment. Thinking of others' welfare is also not to be thought of as an attachment. So do your actions if you are a devotee with a sense of resignation to the divine, as an offering to the divine, and for the welfare, for the well-being of the world. So the motivation of the incentive for work for the unenlightened is for selfishness. But why is such selfish drive called unenlightened? Because ultimately it results in something uh, which is, you can say, now we say that there is a win-win situation, but it is just opposite to that. It is like loss, loss situation. How? I will just give an example. When I was in India, I was in one of the Ramakrishna Mission Center, just opposite to our center on the other side of the road. The residences there, uh, we found a very interesting thing that everyone wanted to encroach a bit more land so that they can enjoy more property. As you know that uh, as it, now the things are changing. In the, previously, the administration was not that uh, strict. So even if that en encroachment was there, there was no, no one to just say them anything. And they thought, it's, it's well, that no one is objecting, let us encroach. And at last the roads got too narrow. And still I remember there was a fire in some home just in, in that area. That's uh, It was just like uh, you say this um, in India, this, the slums. It's like a slum, it is there and the roads have become so narrow. Now the fire brigade came till the main road, but it cannot enter. So if someone is really uh, in, needs some emergency medical service, some ambulance is required, the ambulance cannot enter. So just by thinking of your own selfish end, at last, neither you can, nor it's, it can in any way be helped to the entire society, to the entire community. So it's loss for both of us. So we find that even we may say, though, it, it is most from an example of the slum, but the so-called developed, this urban so civilization. There we cannot think of this type of selfishness. We are all enlightened, but we forget. The same selfishness do act in a different way there also. Just a few days back, I was just reading through an article someone has forwarded it to me, that only that 1% of the population is enjoying 50% of the world wealth. The 50% of the world's wealth is accumulated with 1% of the population, creating a tremendous disparity in the society. At last we will find it's like a carcinogenic society. No one is benefited by that. We may feel that at least that 1% is enjoying. No. When the social disruption, it, at the beginning it may not be palpably visible. But in the long run, if you read the history, always it has happened that this type of polarization has led to social unrest where the one who is sitting there on the top has been pulled down, dragged down by the entire society. Again and again, we find that tremendous social unrest happens because there's a nice saying that if you, that you are a, we are such a, uh, that a, a, a quite big person, when you see a small ant, the ant is terrified by seeing you. If you approach it, it will just start moving towards the corner. But when it reaches the corner, if you still try to go and stamp on it, it will give you the last bite because it knows that there is no other way to run away. It has been cornered. As long as it is not cornered, it is trying to run away. But when it is cornered, then it will give the death bite. In Bengali, it's a moron come on. Before death, it will give a bite. Let's just, so the same thing happens with the society, with all sorts of exploitation that entails from this marginalization, from this polarization, 
at last it do enter in thus uh, what is the entire population as if getting cornered all the risk there is no uh, access to the resource you'll find if now even at present because of the war and all what's the main news every day you open that this economic recession the price of the things are they're just rising so high that it that your this purchase this uh, your power to buy it is going beyond that and that is bound to create social unrest so that's the thing which krishna is also indicating that this unenlightened do everything with tremendous selfishness so a realized soul has to act with that type of intensity but not for that selfish end but for the welfare of others then it will lead to just the opposite the win win situation if the incentive for the work of the enlightened is for loka sangra well being of the entire world it's for atmana moksha jagat hit it's for his own revelation and for the well being of all so when one gets enlightened his or action makes him or her the role model for others to follow that's the idea of the loka sangra he becomes the role model so this the detached action in no way speaks of this uh, what you say this half hearted uns- unskilled some disorganized action it's not like that i'm doing with full uh, what you say that my um, uh, focus with all i try to develop i hone up my skills i do it perfectly i am performance oriented not result oriented i perform to the best of my ability and there it ends so that's how i develop uh, detachment and not only that the detachment leads me to the enlightenment and even when i'm enlightened soul when all my desires has fallen off my chitta has been cleansed my mind has been cleansed i am established in myself then also the action doesn't fall off if we read the bhagavad gita really shloka by shloka nowhere we find the idea of cessation of action has been spoken of many will be commenting on the gita by the idea that actions has been spoken of in gita just for the one who is not a realized soul once you are a realized soul the action ceases action is for chitta shuddhi but nowhere in gita you will find that inaction has been prescribed action continues only thing your orientation changes it is a total uh, overhauling of your orientation it was <clears throat> just for selfish end now it is for the well being for all so with that type of orientation you continue to do your work then the same work instead of binding you becomes the cause of your liberation instead of hampering <coughs> the instead of hampering the social welfare it actually entails in the social uh, upliftment is abhyudaya social upliftment in sanskrit this is abhyudaya it results in it entails in social upliftment as well as your own liberation atmana mokshatam jagati tayacha so the 26 sloka the same idea is na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sangina so don't create confusion don't unsettle the ignorant by resorting to inaction so those who are yet to be enlightened those who are enlightened and enlightened they follow you as a role model so don't resort to inaction and that will create confusion among them buddhi bheda means to unsettle their understanding so don't do that na buddhi bhedam janai agyana those who are ignorant those who are karma sangina those who are attached to their action joshayat sarva karmani vidwan yukta samachara 
So, Vidwan should be yukta, should be engaged in their action. <coughs> so, what <coughs> Joshait Sarvak, the, uh, this they should be engaged in the action, but at the same time, by being detached. So, that's the idea as a conclusion, Sri Krishna is saying in the concept of Loka Sangra, which he was speaking of. That Karma Yoga for an enlightened soul continues because, uh, from the standpoint of Loka Sangraha, it is something which is essential, which is obligatory. They should do it. But <clears throat> because a man of realization, whether they are acting or inacting, that in no way affects their realization. They are established in their realization. So neither seek nor avoid. Whatever situation, the life has placed him, he continues with his action without being attached to it and that way he does welfare to the society. Now, <clears throat> this here in this sloka, we will find the word confusion. That what he is saying that na buddhi bhedan janait is very interesting. That as we didn't understand the implication of Bhagavad Gita correctly. Such a magnificent scripture, such a sublime scripture was there for with us for thousands of years. But as we never understood its implication properly. So if we look at the history of India, <clears throat> we will find that the confusion that arose by considering actionless as the ultimate state of spiritual, uh, <clears throat> spiritually, that ultimate state of a spiritually illumined soul. That we thought that at last action is meant for Chitta Shuddhi, and in that state, when you get established, that actionless is the uh, ultimate state of a spiritually illumined soul, that resulted in twofold degeneration. Now the things are changing. If in in India, you will find that even in the past decades, even at present also, it is there. If you take the entire India as a whole, if you go to the remote villages, you will find <clears throat> the entire civilization has got mummified. The way their peoples are living in utter poverty still is something which can is palpably visible. If you come, if you get, just get down in the airport and you just driving by the road, even in cities, you will find huge barricades. Here in Australia, those walls are there as uh, to uh, as sound barriers so that the noise need not pollute the posh areas. But in India, those walls are not sound barriers. Those walls are meant to hide the slums. The way the people are staying there is something is something unimaginable. Why? That's the idea that that inaction somehow was the idea that a spiritually illumined soul, if he's inactive, he is actually established in that realization. But a general person, an ordinary person thinks that I am realized so. <clears throat> As Sri Ramakrishna Swami Vivekananda used to say that don't think that you have become King Janaka. Janaka was a king who was sitting in the throne. He was the royal king. He was uh, take, uh, taking care of his responsibilities but at the same time he was detached. So the idea which we studied just now Dehasthopi na dehastha. That though in the body, he was not as if in the body. And most of us th start thinking that I am that we are Janaka. See in Shami Shishya Sangbad, Swamiji is taunting that you are really Janakas. Because Janaka was is the, means the historical king Janaka, and Janaka means father. But like you, this totally inactive people, and there's only one thing you have done. You have begetted so many children. 
So that way, you, that you are all Janakas, the father of so many children, utter poverty. You don't know how to manage the family. It has become big. That way, you are Janaka. It's an extremely uh, un, this unenlightened people's extremely unillumined life. So just in dire poverty, they are staying. There is no uh, motivation for personal growth and if you speak to them they will speak that i am detached i don't have this so much attachment to this this worldly uh what you say this um, uh, prosperity i am detached but as we were saying that tamas always comes in the disguise of sattva so the entire civilization got mummified you will find the progress stop and not only that, in, uh, it, it even didn't entail in spiritual illumination. <clears throat> if in our life we will find that if you just uh, not, uh, you are not up to the ideal, you have just, you are just trying to lead a life as per an ideal, but you are not up to that, then you will start pulling down the ideal, you will drag down that ideal. So in India, you will find in the name of religion so many superstitions, wrong practices, evil practices started. Just because as we cannot be up to that ideal, we drag it down. So this twofold, the society got mummified and in the name of religion, all sorts of superstitions, evil practices cropped up. So there was neither Abhudaya nor Nisraya. And for thousand years, we find we cannot deny the fact it happened. Why? That we never understood the true implication of our own scriptures. So that's what Bhagavan is saying in this sloka that na buddhi bhedang janayet agyanang karma sanginam joshayet sarva karmani vidwan yukta samachar. That one should not unsettle the understanding of the ignorant. Na buddhi bhedang janayet. Agyana, that they are all attached to an action, karma sangina. So the enlightened one, what they are supposed to do? Oneself should be steadily acting in the spirit of yoga, joshayat sarva karmani, vidwan yukta samachar, and should engage the ignorant also in work by right? just setting up an example. So that's what Bhagavan is saying in the 26th sloka. So now, the next two sloka is important. Here, just from the standpoint of setting up an example, from the standpoint of the society, Bhagavan Krishna was giving the example of Karma Yoga. And now, he will be just giving the, this, uh, the need for Karma Yoga, the efficacy of Karma Yoga. He will explain it from the philosophical standpoint in the next two slokas. What's that idea? That we are not the doer. It's a very interesting idea. That if uh, at just uh, I feel like going and drinking water, it is I who decide. I am the doer. I get up, go, get a glass of water and drink. So I, I am the doer, isn't it? Anything that in our mind, so many options are there. Kartum, akartum, anyathakartum. And some action has to be done, whether I will do it, whether I won't do it, or shall I do it in a different way, not in the conventional way. It depends on my choice, isn't it? That's what we think. But here Bhagavan will be saying very interesting thing. And which is something which can be understood even from the modern psychological perspective. That's what Bhagavan is now saying. That <clears throat> out of ignorance we think ourselves as the doer. Sri Krishna will be elucidating in these next two verses. <clears throat> that it is Prakriti, it is the nature that is working in all of us through the three gunas, the idea of guna he will bring here, the Sattva Rajatama, three gunas, through these three gunas, he, it is 
the prakriti which is working. It is not we who are working. So that's what Bhagavan is saying. Let us try to read the sloka and then we will try to understand what he is saying. Prakriti kriya manani gunai karmani sarvasha ahankara vimuratma kartaham iti manyate. Prakriti kriya manani. This is a nature, prakriti, which is acting through the gunas, gunai karmani sarvasha. All activities are carried out by the three modes of nature. The sattva, the raja and the tama. But the ignorant, vimuratma, the one who is in ignorance, he is deluded by the false identification with the body. That's the ahankara, this false identification, which results in ego, ahankara. He thinks, I am the doer. Kartaham now, what Bhagavan is saying here, how we can relate with the modern psychological findings, is something very in interesting. Now, many of us don't understand, we just go on repeating that the nature is nothing but constituted of three gunas. What actually it means? The three gunas, sattva, rajatama, whatever I see is nothing but the manifestation of these three gunas, sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Now you will find to understand the true implication of that these three gunas, that entire nature is nothing but is a conglomeration of these three gunas, this mutation of these three gunas. This, this, it is not that they are like uh, three separate water time compartments intertwined, three ropes. But sometimes this is the example they give that you know that the the woman will be having their hair, they will uh, interlock the hairs, they make some reeds and interlock it. It's not like that. That sattva is not something separate, rajas separate, tamas separate. They are constantly mutating. Mutating. What is this mutation which is going on there? So understand what the real implication of sattva, rajas, tamas. Let us try to understand the ideas of Sattva Rajas Tamas in our scriptures. Let us take those ideas and try to find out from all those ideas what these three gunas are and why the scriptures say these three gunas constitutes the entire universe, nothing else. Now, you know, the scriptures say Sattva is illumination. Sattva is of the nature of illumination. Rajas is of the nature of action and Tamas is inertia or darkness. So this is one, let us try to uh, compile all the ideas related to Sattva Rajas Tamas. Sattva is illumination, Rajas is action, Tamas is inertia or darkness. Now Sattva, again, they say that our Gyanendriyas, the organs of perception are pure sattva. Means the, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our sense of taste and touch. These are pure sattva. And the organs, the karmendriyas are pure rajas. Your hand, your feet, your taste, organ of evacuation, organ of procreation. These are pure rajas. And what is tamas? Tamas, this is the tanmatras and the panchabhutas. And we think that this outside world is tamas. It's not that way. We can never understand. Now just see, sattva is illumination. How the illumination happens? Anything to be illumined is through the five senses. The eyes, five uh, what you say, the senses of perception, jnanendriyas. Through the eyes I see, through the ears I hear, through the nose I smell, through my tongue I taste, and through the skin I touch. These sensations, these are the stimuli. So these are sattva. When the stimuli are sattva, and the reaction is rajas, 
That's why Karmendriyas are all Rajas. And Tamas, I think the Panchabhuta, not the Panchabhuta outside. The idea of Tanmatra is very important. Now how the illumination happens? As Swami Vivekananda used to say, when in modern psychology they say, our mind is not vacant. It's not just simply blank. All the ideas are already there in it. It is inherently, it is there in it. All the ideas are there. But as long as there is something, stimuli is not activating your mind. To give a common example, I was sleeping in deep sleep. I wake up, I see a red flower outside. Is the red flower really there outside? No. The light falls on that flower and the, it's reflected. It comes and touches the retina of my eyes. And when it touches the retina of my eye, what happens? That light's function is over there. It's not anymore functioning there. The light's function is over. Then, it, the a nerve sensation passes through the optic nerve. It is passing through that optic nerve. It reaches your brain. This nerve current is reaching your brain. And that particular nerve current, when it reaches the so-called color perception center, it is. The color is as if projected by your mind to give you a sensation that the flower is red. So what's the idea? The various ideas of the colors, the various concepts of the shape, the concept of smell is already there in the mind. External stimuli just evokes them. They were all sleeping, they were dormant. So all this tamas is what? All the ideas, all the concepts which I have of this external world, they are already there in my mind. My mind is not a vacant thing. It is already there sleeping. It is dormant. It is just sleeping there. The external stimuli invokes them. Just see how tamas is being mutated into sattva. Then when I see the flower, then my karmendriyas become active. As per my temperament, I may feel like going and plucking the flower, offering it to the divine, or I may use it for decoration, or I may allow it to be in the garden, I just go and water the plant so that it may, the flowers may bloom. So all these various actions I am doing as per my temperament, which speaks of the karmendriyas. So just see what is happening, that all the ideas are already there in the mind. They are called tanmatras. Why they are called tanmatras? These all ideas are all very discreet. That in a, just when a flower I am seeing, that for a, uh, most of us, uh, what I think that the flower as a whole is there, the red color, its shape, its fragrance, everything is entering through my senses to give the picture of the whole flower in my mind. But it never happens that way. The redness is perceived in the color perception center. The shape is perceived in the shape perception center. These are all separate centers. The fragrance in the perceived in fragrance perception center, smell perception center. So all this then conglomerates to give you a sense of whole. All these individual small discrete sensations conglomerates to give you a sense of whole. So these discrete sensations are called tanmatras. The words are very important. Tanmatra means tat matra. Only that. Only that. Only the redness. Only the shape. Now when they conglomerate, they become panchabhuta. All these tantra matras conglomerate to make it bhuta. So these, all these tanmatras are there hidden in my mind. The, their potency to conglomerate, to give a sense of whole, is already there in my mind. The external world acts as the stimuli with its five senses. The stimuli immediately invokes the ideas in the mind to create the sense of a whole, the flower or whatever it may be. And then my karmendriyas, based on that idea, idea which has evoked, evolved on my mind, my karmendriyas, as per my temperament, induces me to action. So now, does this world exist for anything which is not living? 
Does the sun know that the world is? He doesn't know. It's only we as a human being or any creation. For them this universe is there. It is I who am certifying. How? Because the stimuli creates that ideation and from that ideation comes the reaction. So from a simple microbe to human being, this is the thing which is happening. So Sattva Rajas Tamas speaks of what? At last in the modern language, it is nothing but stimuli response conditioning. The entire universe is, con is constituted of that, nothing else. Certain what actually is there outside, no one knows. How my mind projects it, that I know. As we are all projecting in the same way. That's why we say that this is the reality. It is not an absolute reality. It is a consensus reality. So this consensus reality has been produced because of the projections of the mind hallucinating in the same way. So what's the idea? This entire universe is constituted of the stimuli. And this stimuli is evoking the already available concepts, already con this fund of concepts in our subconscious mind. They are invoking them to give a sensation of the whole. And then we are reacting to that. So now the entire Prakriti is working based on that. So the nature constituted of these three gunas, Sattva Rajas Tamas means Sattva is the illumination, the stimuli. Rajas is the action, the response. Tamas is the inertia or the darkness which speaks of the Pancha Tanmatras and the Pancha Bhutas. So now it actually is that this we have understood that this is actually speaking of the stimuli response conditioning. So this stimuli response, response conditioning will be resulting in the formation of the mental modules. We will just give a very uh, small example that what happens the moment you respond to a stimuli, just take a small bacteria, that we don't have one mind. Even in modern psychology they say that we have various subsets of mind. Each subset, each module has a particular stimuli response conditioning. Based on the environment, external environment, a particular module at it gets activated at one time. At one time there cannot be more than one module which gets activated. At, at any time, only one module will get activated. Which will get activated? It depends on the external circumstances. There is no one mind to command that you get activated or you get activated. There is no one commanding. They are all there. Based on the external circumstances, one of those modules will get activated and it has already fixed stimuli response conditioning. You are bound to respond in that the, the module which has got activated as per the stimuli response conditioning of that module, you are bound to respond. But somehow that because of that ahankara, we get associated with the ego, it is acting in its own way. But it gives us a feeling that I am acting. I have decided to act this way. So Bhagavan is actually speaking of this idea that <clears throat> the Prakriti is working in its own. Somehow our ego gets, uh, we gets uh, attached, our ego gets attached to it and it gives us a sensation that I am doing, I am the doer. So it needs a bit more explanation that how the mental modules are formed. Stimuli response condition we understood. Now how the mental modules are formed. In the process of evolution. Just take a small bacteria. When you give some nutrient, it is drawn towards it. If you give some toxin, it is, it will be uh, withdrawn from it. It will run away from it. So what it speaks of? That when you are giving some nutrient, it immediately it starts forming a new mental module. It's a growth mental module. That for my growth, I have to uh, uh, sustain on this nutrient. So you are drawn towards it. So this creates a growth module. And then that fear of poison, that creates that your self-protection module. You have to protect yourself. So now you will understand in the process of evolution, 
each and every stimuli response conditioning is getting hardwired in our mind to create innumerable modules. So these modules are there in my mind. Now as per circumstances, one of them get activated. It takes its own decision, but giving me a feeling, it is I who am taking the decision. And from that comes the sense of karta. But actually, as per the situation, the mind is acting in its own way. So if even from that psychological point of view, we can try to understand the working of the mind, we shouldn't be having a sense of attachment to the action because we are not the doer. The nature is working in itself. So this is the idea. In, in a short nutshell, we try to explain it. It will need more, we will need uh, a little more uh, illustration on it. So we will continue with this slok again in this next class, this 27th and the 28th, to elaborate this on this idea that why it is being, Bhagavan is saying that we are not the doer. And how this idea is actually something which tallies with the modern psychological finding and how it can lead to the uh, idea of karma yoga where we are supposed to act, act in our day-to-day -day life as per the circumstances. Our mental modules are bound to act in a particular way. It is they who are acting. It is not me who am acting. So we should be acting in a detached manner, not trying to identify our ego with what we are doing. So that's the idea which Bhagavan will be saying in the 27th and the 28th sloka, which we will discuss again, again in the next class. So with this, we stop, stop our discussion today. Thank you all. Namaskars.